So um, this video is based on the European Union as part of the series that I've been making. Um, previously, I've been looking at um, mostly goods in terms of the free movement of goods and services. Uh, but in this particular video, I'm going to be looking at people because as part of the single market, it's not only the free movement of, of goods and services, but it's also the free movement of factors of production such as labour. So um, to begin with, I think it's important to look at the Treaty of Maastricht in terms of ni uh, in 1992, uh, allowing... Um, EU citizens and their family members to move them aside freely within the EU as part of the Schengen Agreement. So what we're going to be looking at within this video is we will be looking at the benefits and what that can add to EU members. Uh, but to actually to begin with, we're going to look at the drawbacks and we're going to look at the, some of the arguments against it and some of the, the pressures it's had on EU members and especially in terms of Eurosceptics. So, in terms of Boris Johnson, I'm going to start off with Boris, uh, Boris Johnson and look at the argument as to um, why it was part of the Brexit uh, campaign uh, in terms of leave. We know the way big corporations have held wages down, some of them as they have had access to very, very big pools of labour from other countries. Now, we know Boris Johnson is the Prime Minister of the UK, but prior to that, obviously, he headed up the Leave campaign. And he was right, really, really influential in that uh, referendum and the referendum result. Now, what he's um, taught, discussing here and, and what this statement comes from is in terms of having 28 countries in the European Union, obviously now it's 27 with the UK leaving. In 2004, there was the EU enlargement with lots and lots of Eastern European countries joining after obviously the end of the Cold War prior to that. Now, these countries, um, there was massive arguments as to whether they were ready to join the to, to join the EU because their economies were very, very different to that of the countries that were already existing members. And there was a lot of criticism that actually these countries need to develop much more before they should join the European Union. And what they were going to do is um, lead to a mass exodus from those countries, migrating to more advanced EU countries and having a big impact on wages. So as we can see from the diagram, we've got on the vertical axis, we've got wages. On the horizontal axis, we've got quantity. And um, if it was just looking at the labour demand and the labour supply in terms of the initial market equilibrium. Um, but if we think about migration, we think about the UK as an EU member before Brexit and how attractive the UK might be. Uh, if you think about it in terms of English speaking, um, if we think about it from the point of view of uh, job opportunities and stable economic growth, and actually just um, pretty stable economic conditions in general, then you could see again why people would want to migrate and, and there'd be a lot of immigration into the UK. And that immigration, especially the, obviously, like I said before, the free movement of labour, it would lead LS to move to LS1. Now, if there was no shifts in labour demand, and um, that would mean that obviously wage would drop from W to W1 because the competition for jobs. That would be especially the case if, um, for example, the labour demand was quite elastic and it was quite easy to find substitutes and find other different types of employees to fill those jobs. And I suppose that's especially being the case with lower skilled work. So in, in lower skilled job, uh, jobs, what we found is uh, an increased competition for workers and those um, British workers who are in those industries have really struggled to compete and, and sometimes they're not being willing to, to compete and they've just been quite critical of immigration and and therefore we've got this obviously this um, I suppose attitude towards migration where they've almost treat uh, the, migra the migrants as almost like a scapegoat for this because you have to look at it from the point of view of who's paying the wages as well. Is it to do with the government not increasing the living wage high enough in terms of the national living wage? Is it to do with the businesses in terms of trying to exploit um, this new pool of labour? But for whatever the reason and whoever to blame, there's been uh, it's been considered to be a disadvantage of the free movement of people. Now I'm just going to show you a quick video based on this uh, and and some of that resentment and, atti and attitude towards migration because of it. Quite literally, the European market at work. In the UK town of Boston, the number of Poles, Lithuanians and Latvians has increased sixfold in ten years. They've arrived here under European Union freedom of movement rules in search of work. But some locals feel overwhelmed. My daughter works in the hospital. Uh -huh. My son was a teacher. And they tell me the, um, the amount of foreign students, foreign patients. And it's just making life harder for them. In two schools there's one child that speaks English as a first language and we have some classes no English speaking and you're thinking that can't be right. 
Party leaders, thank you very much. Indeed. Controversially, Prime Minister, Minister David Cameron wants to be able to limit EU migration, and it's a key issue in the upcoming general election. So that we can sort out this immigration issue once and for all. But despite talking tough, his ruling Conservative Party has failed to reduce the net number of arrivals. Much of the debate has been shaped by the rise of the anti-immigration UK oh, Independence also. Party. Up for tomorrow and mass immigration, uh, particularly from Eastern Europe, has had you know devastating effects on this particular area. Um, you know, it's compressed wages, it's created some huge social problems, and of course, there's a lot of local people now that, that can't get a job. Dean Everett says he's apolitical. But his militant anti-immigration campaign shows the extremes of feeling among some of the townspeople. I didn't want to become a foreigner in my own country. I live in England. I am an English person. I expect to be able to speak English in my own country, not have to learn Polish or Latvian to work in the local factories. Campaigners say such fears are misplaced. Now, uh, another disadvantage, um, which actually relates to the video, but from the other uh, perspective, because if we look at it from, um, for example, these countries that have actually lost these um, these individuals, these citizens. So let's imagine that um, in the in the video, it's kind of criticising the amount of Polish, for example, migrants. But then think about it from the point of view of Poland. Because Poland is part of the European Union and there's that free movement of labour, um, what they're seeing is actually something that's known as brain drain, where people have actually, um, Polish citizens, have decided to leave Poland, take their skills with them and go into a different country, and that other country has benefited from the arrival of those skills. And that's had a massive impact on certain countries. So, for example, the last country to join the European Union was Croatia, and again, Croatia exper experienced those problems. Now, the whole idea of the European Union is obviously to try and develop these countries via trade. And the issue with brain drain is it does impact their productive potential because they're losing out on those skills and it's impacting their productivity. And therefore, when we're looking at it from the point of view of uh, the UK complaining about migration, you can also look at it from the point of view of Poland, for example, uh, complaining about brain drain. So again, I'm going to show you a video based on Croatia and the problems that they've experienced. <laughs> Croatia's sunny coastlines attract tourists from all over Europe. But behind the dreamy landscapes lies an economic unease. This is Zagreb's coach terminal. And every day, young Croatians board some of the 20 coaches bound for Western Europe. 29-year-old Jovana Banovic is leaving for Munich. Five years after graduating, she still hasn't managed to find a job. I graduated archaeology, so it's really hard to, to find a job. From university to the job centre, 27% of graduates are unemployed, and more and more of them are looking for work abroad. There are almost half a million Croatians in Germany, 160,000 in Austria, and 30,000 in Ireland, Sweden and France. Marko Dragucica arrived in Berlin with his wife in 2014. He's since found a job as an electrician and earns three times as much as he would back home. The couple has learned German, made new friends, and they're a point of contact for fellow Croatians. My boss asked me if I knew anyone who wanted to come to work in Germany. I told him I did. I called a friend. He came over and has settled here with his wife. Marco comes from a small village, which was once a battlefield in the War of Independence. The region is still struggling to rebuild its economy, and only the older generation still live here. This local resident showed us the youth centre. Look, it's falling to pieces. It's such a mess, a catastrophe. This is Croatia. There's nothing left here. At Zagreb University, many students are taking up language courses. 
After Croatia joined the EU in 2013, more people are taking advantage of the open borders to settle abroad. My boyfriend lives in Denmark. My friend's sister is in Ireland. And many of my friend's families have moved to Germany. And all of them have found work. For analysts, it's a dire situation and could lead to a drop in the working population. If we talk about public sector, then there is a problem with healthcare system, pension system, social security systems, because they all depend on young people who pay taxes, who work, who produce. There are just under 4 million people in Croatia today, and despite government efforts, the youth exodus is showing no sign of slowing down. So it's not all negative. There's, there's obviously a lot of benefits of the free movement of labour as well. And um, one benefit is in terms of job shortages. So there was always this well-known saying where you can never get a plumber in London. And even though London obviously has a lot of um, city jobs, it has a lot of, for example, the financial sector and a range of different industry, um, there is some um, sectors and some industries that they are lacking in. And when we think about tradesmen, actually London were really struggling with, for example, a plumber. And that was until uh, we started to see that movement from some of the, uh, for example, Eastern European countries who realised that there was opportunities and there were job opportunities because of those shortages and they were the ones to fill them. So they obviously moved, they relocated, they migrated to the likes of London to fill those shortages and therefore it's no longer a problem. And that could be another benefit. So, for example, when there is a job shortage or we are uh, maybe lacking a certain skill, we're able to obviously get that skill and, and fill those job shortages because of the ease of attracting um, individuals and potential labour from other countries as part of the free movement of labour. Now, in terms of Brexit, this could be a problem because obviously there's no longer going to be that free movement of labour. We've brought in a point system, which I'll talk about at the end of the video. And one of the worries is about the vacancies in health and social care because the NHS is a massive employer of uh, not only UK citizens, but also um, EU migrants as well. And as we can see from the data, even looking at, for example, 2015, 2016, before um, any, any trade deal was decided, before any uh, discussion on the, the free movement of people, um, but obviously when the referendum results were announced, um, there was, I suppose, a real concern from European migrants because they didn't feel welcome. And it wasn't about them not being able to um, get, get a visa. It was about, actually, do I want to stay in the UK when they have this attitude, perhaps? And um, you could argue that maybe part of the Leave campaign, not maybe the official Leave campaign, but some kind of subgroups, um, they may have crossed the line. It might have kind of led to a bit of xenophobia. And uh, that was a real worry. And what we can see there is actually people starting to leave, either to return home or to go to other European uh, sorry, EU countries to work there instead. And at a moment, like, for example, now with the, the COVID and the pandemic, um, this is, is a real worry about the job shortages and making sure that we can fill those vacancies. Now, again, I will discuss the point system because the point system should still allow for that, but it's just in terms of uh, the perception of what's happened since Brexit that might be a concern. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of videos about job shortages in the UK and a, bit, a little bit about the concern, especially in terms of hospitality and also the building sector. <laughs> Britain is now laying the foundations for the post-Brexit economy and the most controversial topic of all is finally being broached, immigration. New rules from the Home Office mean low-skilled European workers like these Romanian builders will no longer have freedom of movement. Indeed, the chances are they wouldn't be able to come here at all. And that is causing a real headache in the industry, which is supposed to be rebuilding the housing market. Getting skilled people from the UK, we don't find that difficult. What we find very difficult is the jobs which the British do not want to do. Nobody wants to work in the cold British weather. Nobody wants to work in freezing conditions, work outdoors. So unfortunately, that's the difficulty that we've had. It is, in other words, a controversial issue. So we've got the kitchen here. Another sector at the sharp end of this is hospitality. So we've got Solomon, who's with us from Ghana. And we've got Patrick from Poland. The chances are if you stay at a hotel or eat at a restaurant in this country, at least some of the work will have been done by immigrants. Sarinda so Aurora is a second-generation immigrant who worked his way up to become a billionaire hotelier. 
He doubts his parents would have qualified for this new scheme themselves. I don't disagree with what the government's doing, except I think we need to, I just hope that the government will keep an open mind uh, in the coming months and years and see, well, actually, if he's throttling business such as ours or other industries I've mentioned, that they'll keep an open mind and do something about it quickly. The main thing that draws people into a country isn't the immigration policy, but the prospect of getting a job and improving their lives. If Britain's economy booms after Brexit, so might immigration. If it slumps, well, that might drive off people. Mentioned about the EU enlargement in 2004, and I've already discussed about the potential for new ideas, new skills, and, and boosting the productive potential of a country by attracting that migration. And I think what you have to also consider is, is what they can bring to our country. And this is based on information and data collected by the Financial Times. And it was looking at um, EU migrants from uh, pre-2004 members and obviously because, uh, well, the countries from the EU enlargement as well. And as we can see here, in terms of the ones that are most likely to work, it's the EU members from 2004 afterwards, so after the EU enlargement, that's really contributed to, to the labour force. And I suppose you can look at the demographics, you can look at the type of workers that will move to the UK, and they're the ones who are young, they've got young families, they're, they're, they're of a working age, and therefore they are going to um, clearly what need to work, want to work, and that's why they're moving for those job opportunities. So... Again, what that will do is it will increase the quantity of labour and possibly even the quality of labour because of the, the, the skills that they bring, especially if they fill those uh, job shortages. So what we can do is we can look at it from this uh, diagram as well. And what we've got is um, if we're able to increase the uh, productive potential of the economy by increasing the quantity and the quality of labour, we should see a long run aggregate supply shift to the right. But also because we're increasing migration, and this is, of course, depends on wage remittances and them sending it home, which could be another drawback and another issue. But let's imagine their, mar their, mar their, sorry, their marginal propensity to consume was pretty high. And that could also lead to an increase in aggregate demand. But as we can see, because we're boosting the productive potential, it should still mean that price level is pretty stable. So that would be beneficial for the economy because the quality, the quantity of labour is increasing. Now, what we could also look at is the, um, the net contribution towards uh, fiscal and public expenditure and finances. So when we have a look at this data, and again, it was collected by the Financial Times, we can see that actually the pre-2004 and the uh, post-2004 EU members both have a positive net contribution towards public finances. So uh, this was massively misreported during the Brexit campaign. But actually, what they do is because they're more likely to work, uh, they'll obviously pay taxes in terms of uh, income tax. And, and also because they're working, they're not necessarily um, receiving that much from the state. And therefore, um, they contribute in terms of paying tax, but not claiming as much back in terms of expenditure. So they've got a net positive contribution. But if we have a look at non-EU migration, actually that's a, that's a negative. Um, and also domestically, so uh, UK citizens also have a negative net contribution as well. So when we look at it from this point of view, actually, and this was in 2016 and 17, EU migrants do contribute a lot towards the UK average with regards to benefits and uh, tax revenue. To uh, just to pretty much finish this video off, I'm just going to go for a few evaluation points. So I mean, I'm just going to read a statement from the TUC, um, which, is, which says, For too long, bad employers have been able to use migrants as well as UK workers on precarious contracts, so for example, like zero-hour contracts, to drive down pay and conditions in certain sectors. So free movement in the single market only functions properly when there's a level playing field in the labour market. Now, I think it's worth remembering that when we're looking at migration and we're looking at some of the uh, negative feelings towards migration, sometimes migration is considered to be a scapegoat for what is actually happening in the domestic policy. And we have to think about the austerity that has taken place in the last 10 years. And even the United Nations said that the austerity that we uh, carried out was actually too much to the extreme and we didn't need to do it as much as we have done. And when we carry out austerity and we cut public expenditure, then that's obviously going to put pressure on public services. So when migration is being blamed for the pressure on the NHS, pressure on um, housing, pressure on other factors, um, what we can actually say is, of course it will, because public expenditure is being cut and population is growing. 
And therefore, when we look at, for example, the government saying that they've, they've increased spending on the NHS every single year, actually, if you look at it in per capita terms, they haven't. It's, it's fallen. And that's, that's the worry. So, you, yeah, to have population growth, but also have austerity at the same time, you could argue it's, it's going to have disastrous effects. So what we need to do is we need to also balance it out. And we need to make sure that we didn't carry out the austerity that we did do. Uh, we don't blame migration for it, but we also make sure that employers are paying the right wages and they're not taking advantage of the situation. Now, in terms of some of the key messages, there is little evidence of substantial impact of EEA immigration on the overall employment opportunities of UK born workers. So where some effect is found, yes it is in the lower skilled UK born workers which I've mentioned before, they are more likely to lose out while higher skilled workers actually tend to benefit because a lot of um, big corporations and multinational firms which are located in the UK, they will, um, they'll do lots of uh, European style um, internships or job placements but they're also open to UK people as well. Now that again there's little evidence of substantial impacts of EEA immigration on the aggregate wages. So there is some evidence that lower skilled workers face a negative impact from what we saw in the diagram and I did mention that obviously the more elastic it is in terms of um, the demand of workers then it is going to have that impact. But when you're higher skilled, and I suppose you're more scarce in, in um, I suppose in the supply of labour, then what you can do is you can definitely um, have greater bargaining power and therefore you shouldn't really be impacted by migration. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you a short video just about what the new policy is going to be because now the UK is not in the EU, it's part of, um, it, it's, it's adopted a points system, so I just wanted to show you what that is. This is the first time in decades the government has been able to take back control, run its own immigration system after we've left the European Union, end free movement, end low skilled migration to our country, which means that we will get migration numbers down. But how does the new points-based system actually work? Well, if you want a visa, you'll need to get up to 70 points. How? Well, a job offer gives you 20. Having the right skills gives you another 20. Speak good English and you'll get another 10, so 50 in total. And then if you want to get to 70, you could have a salary over £25,600. Or if you work in a field where there's a shortage of workers, like a nurse or a maths teacher, you get bumped up too. Same thing if you've got a PhD in science and tech. Sounds complicated, but actually, in a sense, it's quite familiar. Now, when you look beyond the facade, actually, this new immigration policy rather resembles the last one that dates back from the new Labour era. You've still got to have a job in order to come here. Unless you've got a high skill level, you've got to pass a certain salary threshold. The main difference, of course, is that nowadays it will apply to EU citizens as well. And actually, that is a big shift.